Good afternoon. Uh, how many of you have uh, Vizio TV? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good. For those of you who don't have it, you got to talk to me later. But anyway, 50% uh, discount. 50%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. So, uh, <laughs> So Vizio did $3.3 billion worth of revenue last year, and uh, we, had, we sold 7.5 million TVs, 1.5 million sound bars, and uh, we're number one or number two, uh, depends on the, the months and the, of the year. And, uh, but we only had 23% market share. So uh, Suvan, uh, I'm not worthy. I don't have a 99% market share, like uh, Codier. And, uh, but we're definitely uh, working very hard to get to that point. Uh, hopefully someday we can come close to that. But anyway, um, I'm not here to, uh, to uh, sell Vizio TV. And, uh, am I? <laughs> I'm here to give it away, no, no. But I got a call from Holly three days ago. You know, I got a three-day notice to come here to try to inspire all of you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, 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 my story. So I was born in Taiwan, Taipei, 1963. So I'm 52 years old. Both my parents were born in China. Uh, my father was born in uh, Shandong, and my mother was born in uh, Sichuan. And, uh, my wife is actually born in Indonesia. She's Indonesian Chinese, Hakanese. And uh, my daughter is actually born in uh, US. So I was born in Taiwan. So we have a, we're the global Chinese village in our house. So I'm uh, very proud uh, to be a, a Chinese American, Chinese Taiwanese American. So uh, um, in 1976, uh, my parents decided to move to Hawaii. Back then, the uh, uh, U.S. cut out their diplomatic relationship with Taiwan, and um, both my parents think that the uh, Taiwan would be like Vietnam, and uh, so that's the reason they say we better find a. They don't want me to go to uh, army, and uh, <laughs> and uh, they want me to get a better education. So we moved our whole family to Hawaii. So I landed in Hawaii in 1976 without understanding of any English. And uh, uh, I was, it was a pretty, pretty bad experience back then for me because, uh, again, I don't speak any English, and I have absolutely no clue about, about American culture. I got to learn that from uh, watching TV and uh, Charlie's Angels and uh, uh, American football. But uh, it was pretty bad because I had no friend whatsoever. And uh, for two years, it was uh, probably one of the the most miserable time in my life. I go to, I, do, I went to a public school, and uh, all my friends, I'm not friends, I don't have any friends. Uh, all the classmates want to beat me up because it's, uh, they think I'm so cool because I don't talk back to them. Every time they ask me a question, I, I, I stare at them. <laughs> they think I'm so cool, so, but you know, I really don't speak the language. And uh, actually, I got beat up. You know, I got in the fight like three or four times because of that. And uh, in 1978, parents decided that uh, Hawaii wasn't a good place for us to stay because it's, uh, people are obviously a little bit laid back. And uh, it's a great place to go, but you know, in the afternoon, 3.30, the wind starts to blow, and uh, you know, I, I usually take a three-hour nap. <laughs> and uh, this is I kept my baby fat all, all my life. So in uh, 78, we moved to Hawaii. I mean, we moved out of Hawaii, we moved to California, so I've been in Orange County ever since. So uh, this is my home, Southern California. And uh, uh, during high school, I really want to be not an architect. Actually, I really want to become, this is my idol, yeah, I am paid. And uh, I want to be an architect. And uh, uh, however, uh, my Chinese parent told me, there's no way we're gonna send you to school to be an architect because an architect doesn't make any money at all for at least 20 years. You be a draftsman for, you get paid like $3.50 an hour. And uh, so, I, but I really wanna be an architect, so I fought with my parents and my parents ended up saying, uh, uh, no way. So I went to USC, 
I studied electrical engineering. And uh, uh, I did get my de degree at USC. However, uh, my GPA was pretty bad. I was a, a 2.3 uh, GPA student. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I was pretty sad. <laughs> But I, sp I spent all my time playing video game in the arcade in USC. And uh, I did get my revenge later on because uh, 10 years later, or 20 years later, USC asked me to go back to the graduate school, uh, uh, graduation, to do the commencement speech. <laughs> <laughs> so although my GPA was really bad, but uh, uh, I did get my chance to, uh, for my revenge. And uh, uh, so, so, with a 2.3 GPA, I couldn't, I couldn't get a, uh, I couldn't get a real job. I couldn't get back to grad school, and uh, I've actually applied uh, at a USC engineering grad school uh, twice, and uh, they rejected me twice, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was pretty bad. And uh, so the whole summer, I had nothing else to do, and I had, but, but I'm not having no choice. All my body went went down to the grad school because the GPA is better, and uh, I had to find a real job. And I couldn't get a real engineering job because uh, nobody wanted me. And uh, uh, however, I did uh, got a great opportunity to interview for a Taiwanese company called Datong. And uh, back then, uh, they got into the computer industry, and they were building computer monitor for IBM, Zenith, Apple, everybody. And uh, they need the application engineer to answer the phone to take complaint from consumers, customers. <laughs> so the job pay uh, $1,700 a month. And uh, with, without having a lot of choice, uh, I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I worked very hard for that job because it's, uh, I feel that I'm, I was a total loser because uh, I didn't get a good grade and uh, my friends, they're still partying in school, you know, getting their master's degree, which my parents both desperately want me to have. They still want me to have it today. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it was, was very sad. Again, another sad part of my life. <laughs> uh, so it was a $1,700 uh, a month salary. I I I, I work very hard. I work from 7:30 to 4:30 at night, and I went to Cal State Long Beach to to get my master degree. And uh, so I have class. I took class from 5:30 to 10:30 at night, and uh, did it for like a couple of years. And uh, I elevated pretty quickly within that home. Uh, I was young, you know. Obviously, I'm. No friends again, <laughs> and uh, I just worked very hard. And uh, uh, so the four year of college, although my GPA was pretty low, I developed pretty good confidence about engineering, about electrical design, product design. So uh, uh, I fell in love with uh, the industry of uh, uh, computer monitor, which is just what Datong do. So uh, I went from a application support engineer to marketing manager to uh, to be in charge of the uh, entire U.S. sales and marketing quickly in four years. I got more salary, uh, 4000 a month uh, by by the end of the third year. And uh, uh, I led a group of uh, 16 people. And uh, you know, I was in charge of the entire sales marketing for North America for, for Datong. And uh, however, the uh, company uh, is pretty conservative. Back then, we were building computer monitor for uh, IBM. And you guys, you young kids probably don't remember, but uh, back then, uh, IBM is the standard for personal computer. And whatever IBM, IBM built is considered the IBM standard. So everything else is IBM compatible. And uh, uh, Daton, Biggest customer was IBM, and uh, so during 1989, 
IBM came out with a, a pretty crazy uh, standard, try to uh, a color TV, a color display standard, which is called 8514, and uh, it adopted interlaced technology. Basically, the 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 the, the 14 inch color screen, which is uh, uh, have all the colors, but it's, it flickers because the resolution was uh, uh, to get to the resolution. They sacrificed the video quality on flickering. And uh, I told the engineers, that there's no way we can build this crap. You know, the people's not going to look at it. And people are going to watch it. And people are going to have a headache. However, uh, I, I, so I recommend another uh, uh, different technology. So I went all the way up to the, uh, the chairman of uh, Datong. And uh, the chairman of Datong told me that, we're, we're IBM house. We we'll make a lot of money from IBM. We're gonna build nothing but IBM compatible. So, shut up. We're not gonna adopt your idea. <laughs> so I was, again, very sad. <laughs> 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 and, uh, however, I don't want to give up. I, I really think I want to build good thing for the consumer. And uh, the consumer is gonna have a headache watching the display. Uh, there's no way I'm gonna build it. So. So I left. So in 1990, I left. I said, I'm going to build a product myself if you don't agree. So in 1990, I, I, I became an entrepreneur. I was 26 years old. Uh, I gave myself a title of CEO. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even, honest, I don't, I don't even understand uh, back then what CEO means. And uh, so I was the chairman and the CEO of my own entrepreneurship. And uh, I, I got $300,000 from, from, uh, from a couple, couple guys. And uh, I put in $50,000 myself and I started my own company. And uh, it, was, it was pretty uh, uh, stupid, I guess, <laughs> back then. <laughs> because I don't even understand what is different between balance sheet and income statement. I just think that uh, it was a good idea to, uh, to build a good product. And uh, uh, the company grew quite a bit. We were profitable since day one. And uh, grew into uh, uh, like $400 million quickly in a couple of years. And uh, making money every month. And along with the PC industry uh, boom. And uh, I got to 600 people pretty quick. And uh, uh, so I made my first million dollar before I was uh, 30 years old. So uh, uh, I was still single, and uh, I put all the money uh, I made back to the company. I saw the advertising. The company got bigger and bigger. And uh, in 1997, uh, everything kind of everything kind of collapsed. Uh, in front of me. The, uh, the PC industry went through this, uh, what we call a commoditization process. And uh, the PC can, became a, com because the internet PC became a commodity, the volume went through the roof. And uh, uh, everybody want to get a PC. So it became a real industry. And for a small company like mine, we went through, you know, major tests. And uh, Back then, I made all the decisions myself, and uh, uh, I still believe that a good product is the main reason why, why we're successful. So I didn't really pay attention to the quality of my management team or quality of my management style, and uh, uh, I still try to micromanage everything. And uh, I opened against a couple of my key employees' uh, recommendation. I did all kind of crazy stuff. We expanded business in, in, into uh, Europe, uh, into Asia. I started to uh, uh, design some crazy uh, technology, crazy product. I spent a lot of money into R&D, into a, a smart TV. People don't know what smart TV was back then. And uh, basically, connect the internet into a TV so we can get internet content onto a TV directly. And uh, that cost me like $20 million. And uh, so by, by the time, before I got to 40 years old, I, 
I lost uh, $40 million. So from the period of uh, uh, between 1997 to 2002, uh, I became a, a turnaround guy. I had to lay people off. I went from 600 people down to like 30, 35 people. And I had to uh, consolidate, consolidate my business. I got to sell business. I got to liquidate the asset. I got to get rid of the, the most painful part was uh, uh, laying people off. But uh, uh, for four or five years, I did that. And uh, I was under a lot of stress. And uh, I was chain smoking. and. Um, my, my <laughs> drink and uh, uh, my blood pressure was 130 over 160 over 130. So uh, in uh, uh, November, not November, uh, October 31st, 2000, I went back to Taiwan to talk to one of my creditor, which I owe money to. And uh, I went to Taiwan to ask for their forgiveness <laughs> that uh, I don't have money to pay them. And I give, I'm begging them to give me more time to pay them off. And obviously, they don't want to see me. And uh, <laughs> they know I don't have any money. So the guy say, no, go away. But I said, uh, you know, in, in Chinese, we say, the uh, <laughs> It means it's the, uh, whatever that means. That means, <laughs> that, means <laughs> that means that I still want to see him. I desperately want to see him because I want to ask for, you know, face to face. I want to ask him to, uh, to give me a hand, you know, give me some, uh, give me some chance to pay him back. So uh, they can only see me around three o'clock that day. However, uh, four thirty was my scheduled flight, China Airline, uh, from uh, Taipei back to Los Angeles. I had to get back that evening because a, that was my daughter's uh, first uh, trick or treat. She was like four years old. And uh, I got to get back that day. So, uh, however, my creditor told me that, uh, uh, yeah, you know, come at three. So I ended up changing uh, my flight. Uh, I went from the, uh, one of the worst records in the world, China Airlines. They're getting better now. <laughs> In case, they're, in case they're a supporter. <laughs> 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 and I changed, I changed into uh, uh, a flight that evening, which is a Singapore airline, the best airline in the world back then. And uh, it's still great. <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, uh, typhoon actually picked up that evening, around 5 p.m., right after my meeting. And uh, uh, I got on the flight against all my friends' recommendation because the typhoon was blowing pretty hard, 50 miles per hour. And uh, I got on the plane because they're taking off. I say, if you're taking off, I'm leaving. So I got on the plane. The plane was moving like this because uh, the wind's blowing, the rain's is falling. And uh, the pilot quickly taxied the plane because he wanted to get out of there in a hurry. He wanted to get out of Taipei Airport before the typhoon pick up more speed. Otherwise, the whole, the whole plane would be grounded for like two days. So he, told, he ended up taking the, he took the wrong runway. And uh, he's supposed to take 5L. However, he saw the first runway, 5R, and he made the right turn, and he took off. And the runway was under uh, construction. <laughs> but only the second half, not the first half. <laughs> So the plane hit 165 mile per hour lift off speed. And uh, uh, I was in the first order of business class, and uh, I was like 30, 40 feet up in the air. And I heard this uh, noise. Next thing you know, the, you know, I was leaning to the left. Uh, the first thing that went through my mind was, uh, I'm, I'm dead. Oh, obviously, you know, it's plain not supposed to lean like this. <laughs> the second thing went through my mind was, uh, oh, God, I miss my family. You know, I have a flashback of my, my daughter, my wife, parents, siblings. 
uh, remember back then I, I went back to Taipei for uh, to beg for uh, forgiveness by my creditor. And uh, the third thing went through my mind was how come all my headaches, all my headache, all my pressure is gone? <laughs> Just like that. You know, it's just like, it's so simple. I have no more headache. And, uh, but quickly, uh, nothing really happened to me. And uh, obviously, the plane hit the, uh, the construction equipment and came down pretty hard. And uh, so the front of the plane kept on going for another mile and a half. Uh, the 60,000 gallon of jet fuel exploded at once. And uh, uh, so I lift my feet up and my hands up. Right in front of me was the bulkhead, the, uh, the wall. So that was my crash position because I assumed that the wall was going to hit me pretty fast. The moment I left my feet up, the fire came underneath me. And uh, uh, it's pretty scary. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and quickly the fire disappeared. I say, God, I didn't get burned. I didn't get barbecued. And uh, so what do I do? So because I don't have any patience, so I unbuckle on my seatbelt. I say, I'm going to get out of here. And the fire disappeared because it's, uh, the explosion sucked out the oxygen away from the fuselage. And uh, uh, however, the, the moment the fire disappeared, the, all the oxygen was gone too. So I couldn't breathe. So I buckle on myself. I say, I'm going to get out of here. I don't care how. So I was the only guy running on a plane. <laughs> uh, so I wanted the door on the right. I couldn't I swing that arm back and forth, back and forth. I couldn't open it. But however, I didn't give up. So I tried to go to the door on the left. And uh, by the time I got to the door on the left, the plane stopped. And uh, the last few seconds, I had no memory. Next thing I know, the door blew open, and uh, the hot air tried to rush out, and uh, the door swing open, and uh, the hot air pushed me out. I got ejected from, from, the, from the plane. So I got out, and uh, I ran quickly. I don't know I can run that quick. <laughs> uh, and eight people followed me out. So in that, there was uh, 81 people die. Uh, it's pretty sad. And uh, so many people lived, and uh, among the so many people who lived, like nine people was wasn't injured. I, I was fortunately uh, to be one in the night, and uh, I got out and got uh, smoke inhalation, carbon monoxide uh, poison, and uh, I went to the hospital a couple hours later, and uh, they treated me with uh, all those uh, carbon monoxide poison, and uh, and they were bringing people into the hospital. And uh, a lot of people were injured, and the hospital was packed, and uh, I say, I'm going to get out of here. So I left. I went back to uh, my parents' house in Taipei, and uh, I was missing action. Nobody could find me for a couple of days because uh, I just left. And uh, my creditor saw my name on the news. <laughs> it, actually, it felt so bad that uh, because of them, I, I, I changed the flight. And he sent a whole troop to look for me in the different, there's a, there were three hospitals. And uh, uh, one of us, the hospital I went to was Chang'en. Actually, Walter, your, your, your father built a hospital. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, they couldn't find me. And they worried so much. And uh, two days later, I say, I say David, I, I'm OK, no problem. It was such a relief for him. So because of that, he feels so bad for me, and he gave me more time to pay out the loan. So that, that gave me a lot of breathing room to be successful again. So quick, yes. <laughs> so you never know. So again, I didn't give up. I didn't give up running. I didn't give up on a plane. I didn't give up my life. And uh, I didn't give up uh, uh, screw out of business. And uh, in 2002, I started Vizio. I say, let's go at it again. Now this time, I know what to do. I know I better build a better management team. I know I better not trust myself. Three minutes. <laughs> I better, I'll be quick. And, uh, and uh, I know I, I know a lot, maybe I know, 
so much I can do this time around. So in 2002, I took out $350,000 worth of mortgage from Wells Fargo on my, against my house and started Visio. So uh, uh, this time around, I, I, I tried to do everything better. And the uh, uh, funny part was uh, four years later, after 2002, I started Visio, Singapore Airlines paid me $900,000 for sitting on my flight, even though I wasn't injured because uh, there was a class action loss. This is a long story. I need 20, 25 minutes to talk about it. But, but uh, in that to be a pretty uh, uh, blessed good thing that uh, I took that $900,000, I gave $200,000 to lawyers, and uh, I paid my $350,000 off my mortgage against uh, Vizio. So that's really how I started the company. So. <laughs> And so, so uh, since 2002, it was, was great. And uh, the company became number one in 2007 uh, with six, only $600,000 worth of capital and a $2 million uh, uh, second round. And I was able to build a, a $3.3 billion company. And uh, we're number one or number two in the US right now. And uh, uh, people ask us, how do you stay on top? How do you, with $600,000, how do you build this big, huge empire? And uh, 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 which, you know, we took out Sony, literally, and Panasonic. And uh, I told him, you just had to focus on what we're believing. We believe that we can build great product, great technology, uh, at an affordable price. And the affordable price came from our saving, came from management's uh, 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 knowledge base. Uh, how do we efficiently run a distribution channel? How do we run a supply chain? And uh, technology came from us, too. And we've got to constantly try to disrupt ourselves was a new technology. You know, our business is pretty tough. Every year we'll come up with a new product, new technology. And constantly what we try to do is disrupt against ourselves. Not just our competition, but disrupt ourselves. For example, uh, five, six years ago, um, we decided to build smart TV. And uh, today we're the biggest smart TV producer in the world. And uh, we have over 20 million smart TV in, in the field today. However, most people saw all the, feed, saw all the feedback from the consumer. People don't want to use the app on the TV. Right? They're sick and tired of all the apps, right? They have apps on their phone already. So for the last two years, we've been researching and say, how do we disrupt ourselves? So uh, as of two weeks ago, we, we, we launched our P series TV, and we decided to remove all the smart TV apps away from TV. We're going to make the TV extremely dumb. And at the same time, you know, what's the, the, what's the one thing that people complain the most about TV? Your remote control. How many people know how to operate a remote? I don't. <laughs> you know, I bought some. Obviously, you guys all seen this. You know, look at this. Look at all the keys, you know? I probably know 4% of it, right? I probably only use 20% of it. <laughs> So this is, this, is, this is old technology. This technology is 34 years old. But everybody knows how to operate an app, right? Everybody knows how to swipe your phone. Everybody knows how to uh, integrate, you know, go into different layers of app. Just uh, a four-year-old knows how to use a phone now, right? <laughs> so what we did is that we moved every single remote control function into the phone now. All you had to do was download a smart TV app, a smart cast, some kind of smart cast app from Visio. So, like it or not, you know, we're going to use your phone to control our TV from now on. So, that being said, I've got to give you some commercial. Again, over here is uh, uh, to tell you what we do, <laughs> not to sell TV. <laughs> so, could you play a little commercial that uh, probably...
With Vizio SmartCast, you rule your content. Cast music, TV shows, movies, and more to any SmartCast display or speaker from anywhere in your home. All from one ingenious little app. So again, I, again, I'm not, I'm not here to sell TV, right? <laughs> but just in case you're, you have interest, the P series is uh, 50 inches at 999. <laughs> <laughs> at Buy Spy, before any of uh, my discount. But it's a little thing like this is making us different than all of our bigger, huge competitors like Samsung or LG or Sony or Panasonic because we care. We care for the consumer. We are the consumer. I'm not trying to sell a particular technology so I can make a lot of money. We sell that technology because we truly believe, like 30 years ago when I started in this business, I truly believe we need to build a product to benefit the consumer, just like the old Dotton days when I started my first business, and same thing today. So.